Hi, Steve from Music Technology here. In this video, we're going to return to looking at our linear power booster one circuit. This is the one that we've been using for the last few weeks, built up on the breadboard. It was how it was made when it was originally released with the two capacitors, four resistors, transistor, and then the pot on the output. This is the one we've been calculating and measuring. Over here is a version of the modern production linear power booster one built up on my new prototyping pedal that I built in the last video. Here, there's many additional inclusions. So first of all, on the input and the output, we have a ferrite bead and capacitor filter here and here on the output. We have an extra pull down resistor on the input. Then we have the heart of our circuit here with the two capacitors and the four resistors and the transistor in the middle. Here's our potentiometer on the output. And then you'll notice we also have this 100K resistor also on the output. And then all of this over here in the top left corner is the power section. So we have a reverse polarity protection diode, another ferrite bead and capacitor filter, and a larger value capacitor and a smaller value capacitor filter. So what we're going to do today is we're going to go through each section of this and have a look at what all these extra additions do and how this is designed to be used in a modern environment and maybe help filter out things that didn't exist when this was originally produced. So one of the first changes to be made was the introduction of this pull down resistor here. In the modern production version it's 2M2 or 2.2 mega ohms but in other versions it's 1 mega ohm and this is to stop any stray charge that's built up on this capacitor on the input from popping the pedal when we switch it on. So let's have a look at this on a breadboard and see if we can hear what's going on if this capacitor is inadvertently charged up with some DC voltage. So I've got my function generator set up with a 220 hertz tone going through here and into my lab amp. And if we switch it now, there's no audible pop. So this is the voltage across that capacitor that I'm using to introduce this DC component onto the signal. So what I'll do now is I'll use this old battery here to charge up that capacitor. And you should see now that we've got about 8.2 volts on there. So now we'll get a very clearly audible pop when we switch. So hopefully you can hear that. Now we want to get rid of that voltage as quickly as possible. So we would use some kind of bleed resistor. Now I've chosen a much smaller value than in the actual circuit here, as you can see, because I've got a much bigger capacitor there to drain. So I've just tweaked these values so you can actually see what's going on there. So let me take this to ground and you'll see that it's very quickly falling now as that capacitor discharges itself through that resistor. And once we get back down to the millivolt range, we should no longer get a pop on our signal. So let's try it about one volt here. So still, I can still hear a tiny pop there, but now we're in millivolts. Now we're back to normal switching again. Returning to our AC analysis from video two, we calculated that R1 and R2 in parallel on the input was 39.09K as reflected here. But now we've got an extra resistor here, which is our pull down resistor and its value is 2M2. And if you're already thinking that's such a big value, that it's not gonna have a significant effect on the input impedance, you're right. But let's run the maths anyway, just to be sure. So one over R total equals one over two M2 plus one over 430K, which was R1 plus one over 43K, which was R2. And if you put that into the calculator, you get 38.408. Kilo ohms. So you can see that that's not significantly different to this figure over here and will make 
no practical difference to the input impedance. Whilst we're on the subject of resistors, you'll also notice there's this extra 100K here at the end. And if you're thinking this is to do with output impedance when the volume part is turned all the way up, effectively removing it from the circuit, then you'd be correct. And we can recalculate our output impedance with this value. Returning to our previous videos, output impedance calculations, we calculated 9K with the potentiometer turned all the way to one side and 1K with it turned all the way to the other side. But if we take a 100K potentiometer, turn it all the way one way and then measure it, you'll see that we don't actually get one kilo ohm. In this case, we get 0.61 ohms and then 100K the other way. Let's try that to the other side. So you can see I'm getting about 0.5 ohms over here. So we could say this is less than an ohm actually. So let's rerun our output calculation, taking this into consideration instead of assuming the 1K. So as you can see, we've actually got 0 0.5 ohms, which effectively means that this doesn't exist here. And this would be the full 100K for all practical intents and purposes. So first of all, let's add our 100K here and see what difference that makes. So now that's in parallel with this. So we get 110 kilo ohms, which is the sum of this one and this one. And that is in parallel with 100K. And if you run that calculation, you get approximately nine kilo ohms. So that's much better than one kilo ohm. It's much closer to this value, but it'll also affect this side as well, of course. So if we have it here too, we now need to work out 10K in parallel with 100K in parallel with 100K. And if you're thinking this is a smaller value, so it's still gonna be close to this value, you're right, of course. And if we run that maths, we get 8.3 recurring kilo ohms. So these two values are now very close to each other. So we've got a much more predictable output impedance from our pedal, which is very close to the value of RC, which is why people say the value of RC is roughly the output impedance of a common emitter amplifier circuit. Now let's have a look at the power section with its diode for reverse protection, our ferrite capacitor filter, and these two filter capacitors here. We can do some basic experiments to try and visualize what's going on in this section and how it filters any stray frequency that might be on the power. So here I have my function generator set up with a DC level output, which is about nine volts, and that's emulating our nine volt power supply. It's going into the breadboard and it's being read here by this voltmeter and also by the oscilloscope. Now, the reason the oscilloscope is showing a square wave is because I've superimposed on that DC voltage a one megahertz square wave at the lowest setting without attenuation that my function generator will go, which is about 400 millivolts. Now, most switch mode power supplies these days work from about 100 kilohertz to one megahertz. So imagine you've got your pedal plugged into the same power block as something with a switch mode power supply, and that frequency is leaching onto your pedal. This is kind of emulating that in a pretty unprecise and loose way. But the reason that I'm doing it is to show you how we use filter capacitors to filter out some of this interference. So in the linear power booster, we have our electrolytic, which is 47 microfarads. And we also have this 100 nanofarads capacitor as well. So let me put those into the breadboard and see what effect that has on this interference here. And also keep an eye on the voltmeter. So first of all, I'm gonna put in the 47 microfarad capacitor into this breadboard. And you'll see immediately that interference that flashed up there was just because I'm near the breadboard. Immediately it's filtered out most of that signal. Let's zoom in a little bit to have a closer look at this signal. You can still see there's a little bit of ringing here from our square wave. So now let's put in our 100 nanofarad capacitor 
in parallel with this capacitor and see what effect that has. So if I move away and try and remove myself from the equation, you'll hopefully see that that's reduced it more. We'll zoom right in now to 10 millivolts per division. We were on 100 millivolts per division before when we were first looking at the oscilloscope and the DC voltage hasn't changed. Now, if I take these out, both of them, you'll see that we now get that waveform again. And just to show you how far zoomed out I am, take it back down to 100 millivolts per division. Now, there's another reason that you use two capacitors to filter the power here, but we need to look at a little bit of capacitor theory to work out why that is. So let's do that now. In an ideal world, we'd have a capacitor that would exhibit nothing but capacitance. But in reality, capacitors look more like this. This is your equivalent series inductance. This is equivalent series resistance. This is equivalent parallel resistance. This is the capacitance. Now, because of that, at some point, this will take over from this. So we can plot that on a graph if we have two axes here and we have frequency and that's going to be a logarithmic scale and we have impedance which is also going to be a logarithmic scale. Then the capacitor will look like this. This is the capacitive region and the one that we've been using up until now. And this is the inductive region. And right in the middle there, this is its resonant frequency. Now, the smaller the capacitor value, the higher its resonant frequency. So one of the reasons that we use multiple capacitors in power filters is because if you've got another smaller value capacitor, it's going to look like this on the same graph. And you can see the capacitive and inductive regions here overlap. So when this blue one starts to fail, then the green one can take over for those frequencies. And remember, this is logarithmic. So say one megahertz is down here, then this is 10 megahertz. 100 megahertz. So that's just one of the reasons that we might use two capacitors together and also introduces this idea that components like this one are actually more complex when we come to dealing with higher frequency applications such as blocking radio interference. So returning to the experiment where I've got DC voltage coming out of my function generator and going through this um, breadboard power section uh, 9.1 volts DC, and then I'm superimposing a signal. So I've upped my output signal now to about two megahertz, which is the limit of my function generator here. And I've just given it a little bit more amplitude so we can see it better on the oscilloscope. You'd be unlucky if you got that amount of interference at a set frequency. But here, even though we're at 2.2 megahertz, we're getting some higher frequency resonance as you get in square waves when you generate a square wave. And this here can help us visualize to some extent what's going on with the ferrite bead and smaller value capacitor in the power section of this pedal. So as I add these components, pay close attention to this part of the waveform. I'm gonna add the capacitor first of all like so. Now hopefully you saw that's reduced some of that resonant frequency there. Now I'm going to apply the ferrite bead. And again, pay attention to this part of the waveform. Now you'll see here, we've got a little bit more resonance here at the peak, but it's smoothed out the rest of it. And of course, remember that the rest of this is gonna get filtered out by those other capacitors in the power section anyway. This is obviously reacting to much higher frequencies. And this is the best way that I can kind of show you to visualize that using my own lab equipment 
obviously if we had a much faster function generator and an oscilloscope that went up to a higher frequency, this goes up to 50 megahertz, we'd be able to see what was going on in this filter a lot better. But also, it's only really a rough simulation on a breadboard because remember those clips in the breadboard also have their own capacitance and with this small value capacitor here we're getting towards the kind of range of capacitance that you get from those clips but hopefully that's enough to give you some idea of why that ferrite bead and small value capacitor filter is also there in the power section. So quickly returning to this power section experiment, I've built up the entire power section with all three capacitors and a ferrite bead on the breadboard here. Um, and I'm sending it some interference, as you can see, again on the oscilloscope, exactly as before. It's bypassed at the moment. So let's uh, plug in this section and see how well it filters out all of this emulated interference. Now remember, this is not a precise Thing. It's just really to help us visualize what's going on in here. We would really need um, lab equipment that could generate much faster waveforms in order to see what's going on here properly. But it's good enough for us to get an impression of how it's filtering out those unwanted frequencies. Let's talk about how this protection diode, which is a silicon 1N. N4001 works to protect the linear power booster from reverse polarity power. You can see here you've got about 700 millivolts as you'd expect uh, across a silicon diode. This circuit here has a special LED in it which is green when the polarity is correct and then if I reverse the polarity of this you see it lights up red. So you can tell the polarity from this LED, it's a special uh, green red LED. But we're going to use it to show you how this diode works. So I'm going to wire it in as it would be normally in the normal circuit across the power there. So you can see it's still green at the moment. Now, if I turn it around now, we should get no current flow in the LED or the resistor because it's going directly through the diode, as you can see. And what's happening to that diode now is it's getting extremely hot because this is dumping a lot of current through it and the battery will warm up as well, which is why I'm gonna stop doing that. But it's protecting our circuit and if we plug it back in normally, you'll see that it still works. So what I'm gonna do now is we're going to use the power supply so we get some indication of what's going on when we reverse the polarity. So again, under normal polarity, it's pulling a very small amount of current. What I'm going to do actually is I'm going to limit the current that the power supply can put out. So I'm going to go into constant current mode and yes, limited already to 230, 240 milliamps. Okay, so now I'm going to connect this the wrong way round. And you can see it's immediately clamped here at my 230, 240 milliamps, and it's dropped the voltage accordingly. And it's actually protecting that diode. So I've just got it wired directly to the power supply here, and you can see over there that it's drawing 230 milliamps but just imagine if your power supply like a battery wasn't current limited so that's now pulling five amps all right the limit of my power supply now nine volts five amps there you go there goes the magic smoke don't try this at home just as a quick testament to how tough these diodes are, we all saw the magic smoke escaping there and it's definitely not measuring what I did before, but it still reads as a diode with a 658 millivolt drop across it, which is incredible really. We've seen how the capacitor and ferrite bead filter works in the power section and we've tried to visualise that using the lab equipment that I have here. You'll also note though that it's included in the signal path as one on the input and one on the output. Now in the modern version of this pedal, when you bypass the pedal, it doesn't bypass that ferrite bead capacitor filter on the input or the output. 
And for that reason, some people will like to actually modify their pedals and take those out by clipping off the capacitor and hard bypassing the ferrite bead. How much effect that has on the signal is debatable, but you can see why they've designed it in here because things now exist in our environment, such as 4G, 5G signals, switch mode power supplies, and other things that make high frequency noise that didn't exist when this pedal first came into production. So when you make a commercial product, you have no idea where it's going to be used. And therefore it's always best to include these things rather than not. However, in a relatively sound environment, without too much interference in a grounded and shielded box, it is debatable as to whether you actually need these things in your pedal and you might find that you never pick up any interference at all, even with your circuit made on top of a pedal on a breadboard like this one. I say that because I tried extremely hard to pick up some interference to show you what these filters did while I was making this video and I was unable to pick up any even with my circuit exposed like this with long leads. So there is a debate there. And if you go searching uh, on the internet about it, you'll find lots of various opinions on these filters and what effect they're having here on your signal. So do they affect the sound of the guitar? Well, let's finish this video by having a play through this one and then through this one and seeing if there's any sonic differences. So I've got my Fender Jazzmaster this time and it's running through this pedal and then this pedal then into that little lab amplifier there. So we might get a little bit of solid state breakup, but clean, it sounds like this. And then if I engage the traditional circuit, version. So as you can hear, there's not much difference between these two sonically, but this one has definitely been designed for a modern environment where there's much more potential to pick up interference, hence the filters on both the audio path and the power path. It also has design elements in there, such as reverse protection in case the wrong power supply is used. It's got a filter for the power to keep it nice and stable. We've got our input pull down resistor here to minimize popping when we switch the pedal in and out. And we've got our resistor on the output, which means our output impedance isn't as reliant on the position of this potentiometer. All of these would be things that you'd include in a production version. So don't let that stop you from building a simple version like this and running your guitar through it. The whole point in learning how these pedals work and how what these components do in these circuits is so we can build them and run our guitar through and see what it sounds like. And that's the most important thing at the end of the day. Now I hope during this series, you've learned as much as I have in examining these circuits and looking at the maths and some of the elements in isolation that go into them and how they build together to create this. This has been the last video in this series, but I'll be back with more deep dives very soon. In the meantime, happy experimenting. I'm Stu from Music Technology. Have a great week and I'll see you again soon.